Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 20 of my beta campaign. Uh, a little later on, we'll be launching another Keo stationary satellite, and we're going to be using, instead of a maneuver node, we're going to be using the some of the rendezvous features that are built into Kerbal Engineer and talking about those, uh, as well with Bill and Tom Plock and Rod Bart forced to abandon ship at the end of last episode and take refuge in the Hipparchus station along with uh, Lunny and Robble and Genimal, uh, that leaves a full two-thirds of my Kerbals uh, in space in that station. I only have three Kerbals actually on the surface, so something has to be done to rectify that and to get those two down, or the, the three guys back down, and that will be done a little later in the episode. But what we have here is Muna 2. Now, if you've forgotten Muna 2, I can't blame you. Muna 2 has been up in orbit for 113 days, uh, quietly going around the moon, really not doing much of anything. And, he, and then I picked up this mission to pick up some further temperature scans. Um, and so I thought, well, there's still some fuel left in the can, so I'm going to use this to try and see if I can pull in some of these temperature scans. So here I am pulling in uh, one of them and then you can see it's going to take a little while before I get to some of these other ones so let's go on and do something else. So that brings us to KeoComSat4 and I'll explain why I'm putting up a fourth Keo stationary communication satellite in just a second. But uh, what I want to draw attention to right now is the, the, the three SRBs that are on this particular rocket. On the top of them, they have these SRB nose cones, which actually act like separatrons do uh, and force, uh, they, they fire when you release and, and, and push the boosters away. They work really, really great, provided you point them in the right direction. Yeah, so I kind of got lucky there. That could have gone a lot worse. I could have lost this mission, but uh, yeah. So lesson learned: make sure your uh, your nose cones nose cones are pointed the right way. But anyway, let's get let's get on to the mission. The mission here is to put this satellite into an orbit with a period of six hours. Now, the cheapest way to do that would be to just keep periapsis low and just burn until your apoapsis gets high enough that you have a period of six hours and then you end up with this really eccentric orbit but when you get out to apoapsis it would be a tiny little burn to put periapsis into the atmosphere so you can then deorbit. It would be definitely the cheapest way to do this but I was forced to carry on this antenna this Reflectron KR14 antenna I had to go on this to, as one of the mission requirements and this antenna quite literally weighs a ton, very literally. It's a very big thing. So I thought, you know what, if I'm gonna lug this thing into space, I'm gonna make some use of it. So I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put this thing into Keo stationary orbit to have another antenna that will uh, that can reach out uh, to my interplanetary probes. Now this particular antenna has a range of 60 thousand kilometers. No, that's not right. 60 million kilometers. What am I thinking about? Off by a factor of a thousand there. And that's a 50% increase over the Communitron 8888, which is the largest antenna I've put on anything so far. And you might think, wow, that's great. It can reach 50% farther. That's, yeah, that, that does sound really good. Except the only thing that's 50% further out than Duna is Drez. So you get one other planetary body. It's not enough to reach out to Jewel or Elo. So, uh, I don't know, it's not one that I normally would use, and it's probably not one uh, I would pack on here except for the fact that uh, it was a contract requirement. But once I got this thing into low carbon orbit, um, before I had a chance to put it out into geostationary orbit, it was time to check in on Luna 2 and see how it was doing with those temperature scans. Back at Luna 2, we were able to pick up two more temperature scans before it was time to buzz out to the Alhazen once again. Yeah, it's a flurry of activity today. And the Alhazen? Well, our Kerbals have gotten a little bit tired of simply driving this thing around the KSC, so Bob's on an expedition and his destination are those mountains that you see on ahead of us. Yeah, Bob, Bob's going for a little bit of a drive. Because there are three uh, biomes on Kerbin that I've yet to take surface samples from. One of them is the mountains, the other ones are the tundra and the badlands. Now to be quite honest, I'm actually quite used to always being able to drive east of the KSC and somewhere in these grasslands I end up usually running into some tundra but uh, it didn't pop up this time. I'm wondering if maybe, I mean it was obviously 
a bit of a glitch and maybe maybe they maybe they patched that thing I don't know but anyway what I did find out about the Alhazen is electric vehicles and climbing power yeah really don't go together so once the uh, the uh, slope of our land started to get pretty steep uh, yeah this thing was struggling a little bit I, I but once if you turn it sort of you know I kind of approached it on a bit of an angle and kind of zigzag my way up the hill and you know Bob was Bob was holding on, and well, it got there. That's that's all that matters in the end. We ended up getting there and uh, collecting our science and our surface samples from the mountains. And after that mission was done, I thought it was time to take a look at my strategies again. So I'd already deleted the uh, unpaid research because I didn't have any reason to generate more science when uh, I was getting close to maximizing my R&D center science at the time and then I thought you know what would be probably best would be to increase my fundraising up to 75 percent so now uh, that is generating more income for me hopefully and hopefully I'll be able to unlock some more buildings soon so let's get back to Keocom Sat 4 now the plan here is to put this thing into Keo stationary orbit I've already mentioned that and that's that's what I need to do to fulfill the contract uh, but I want to do something a little more interesting than that. I want to put it exactly halfway between KeoComSat1 and KeoComSat2. So here's how we're going to do it. We're going to select KeoComSat2 as my target. And then I'm going to use the rendezvous tools that come with Kerbal Engineers. I've been trying to wrap my head around these numbers, and one of the ones I have figured out is this intercept angle. Once you've selected your target, when that intercept angle gets down to zero, that tells you when to do your transfer burn to go out and meet your target. Well, that's great, but I don't want to get out to KeoComSat 2. I want to be between it and KeoComSat 1. Well, there are three satellites in this Keo stationary orbit right now. So they're each, if you take the 360 degrees of the orbit and divide by three, they're each 120 degrees from each other. So I want to be halfway between, so that's 60 degrees. So if I'm 60 degrees behind, KeoComSat2, I'll be exactly halfway between KeoComSat2 and KeoComSat1, or, you know, pretty close to being halfway between. But what I want to do is not burn when my intercept angle gets down to zero, but to burn when my intercept angle gets down to 60. Then I'm 60 degrees behind it. And remember, the thing is, is that I will be behind it because I'm in that lower orbit, so I'm catching up to KeoComSat2. KeoComSat2 is going a lot slower than than, uh, than I am in low carbon orbit, so I will be 60 degrees behind it, and that should place me exactly halfway between KeoComSat 1 and KeoComSat 2. And we'll cut over to our approach towards Apoapsis, and yeah, things are looking pretty good. I think we're looking pretty close to being halfway between KeoComSat 1 and KeoComSat 2, and cutting over to our completion of our finish, our circularization burn, and then we'll take a look at our final result here. And, well, yeah, you know, exact. Exact is a relative word. But if, if we take a look at our position in our orbit, I mean, it looks good. And let's face it, that's all that really matters. Now, one of the things you may have noticed uh, back there when the period component of the contract went green, there was also a time component. I was supposed to leave this satellite up there for 21 and a half days, but as you can see, I didn't get that uh, that timer once again, and th this happened uh, several episodes ago with another mission, that JunkSat 8 mission, where the, the timer refused to go off. There was something that was just uh, borked about the campaign. I think it gets confused, uh, these Mission Controller 2 campaigns with the timers, they, they get confused when you are using things like multiple missions going on at the same time and, and it gets confused with parameters and it thinks the mission has failed or something. I'd, I don't know. But what I did is I just set an alarm for uh, 21 and a half days into the future and if I don't get the contract in that time, I'll get into editing some save files. And I mean, I know that I did it, so there it is. Then it's back to Muna 2 to see if I can pick up one more of these above the surface temperature scans. Now I know you see two of them there, but one of them is actually on the surface, which obviously this craft is not at all capable of doing other than in a violent explosive type of manner. Um, and that last one is actually going to be the landing site for my Kerpalo mission, which should be coming up 
next episode. But uh, yeah, this thing's getting down, getting down pretty close to the end here. After uh, uh, one last periapsis adjustment, I only have 59 meters per second of delta V left. And also, the communication is getting a little bit sketchy. I'm noticing sometimes when I come over near the target site that I do not have a communication link with the Kerbal Space Center. So I'm, I'm looking at the satellites that are going around, the ones that are potentially relaying sat, uh, signals, and, and, and one of them out here is positioned reasonably well, so I figure I should go for it. So I'm gonna take, uh, um, I'm gonna push over the plane of the orbit, use a normal burn to move the plane of the orbit over just a little bit to try and see if I can catch it on this pass, because I don't know if I'll be able to get a future pass after this. So I burn, 24 meters per second more fuel and uh, to adjust my plane just a little bit but I just didn't adjust it enough I missed it on this pass so I'm like oh my gosh you know I'm only gonna get probably one more kick at the can at this one so we come around again I can see that my relay satellite is still in a pretty decent position to relay the signal um, I once again go for this normal burn making sure I'm burning in the right direction and uh, I end up burning up all the rest of my fuel. So this is it. This thing is dead now. If it, if it isn't right now, it just isn't going to be right. And this time, yeah, I got it. So there you go. All of the... This has been a good little workhorse for me now. It's gotten all of these temperature scans just out of what was left over in its fuel can. And we'll have to save off the completion of this particular contract until the next episode and uh, a manned lunar mission. But now it's time to join Manuki in the Kayam 2. And Manuki's job is to go up there and bust up that party that's been going on on the Parkus station and to drag Bill and Rodbart and Tom Plock back down to terra firma. Now, just to sort of change things up, I thought I would do this ascent and rendezvous completely from the cockpit view. And I've also turned off the flight assist, so no KOS. And I've turned off the information coming at me from Kerbal Engineer. So I'm going to do this just using the displays in the cockpit provided by the raster prop monitor. So we've made sure our SAS is on. We've throttled up to 100%. And then it's time to just push that stage button to get ourselves on our way. Here we go. And we're going to do a proper gravity roll. We're going to roll this thing upside down just like the real space shuttle. And then we're going to put it up to two times speed just to sort of uh, make this not quite take so long. So just to sort of explain what we got happening, I got some external cameras on the right hand screen. And right now I have it on a camera um, pointing at the SRB so I can keep an eye on it, on one of the SRBs. In the middle there we have a giant nav ball um, and it's also giving me lots of flight characteristics at the same time. I can keep an eye on that. And on the left screen I have my orbital characteristics which is giving me my apoapsis, my periapsis, the time to each of those, as well as altitude and inclination and eccentricity and that kind of stuff. So I'm keeping an eye on the SRB fuel there on the left and when that's drained out it's time to stage again. There we go, there goes our SRBs and then we continue on. So what do we have? We got just past an altitude of 15 kilometers. Our periapsis is at 25, or apoapsis, sorry, at 25 kilometers. There we go, 20 kilometers um, for the altitude. Still pitching over. I've turned on the RCS just after I ejected the SRBs because uh, I know that pretty soon I'll be needing that RCS to help me keep attitude control. Switch the camera view. Now we're looking, this is a camera that's on the fuselage underneath the orbiter. And it's staring right down onto the tank. Oh, taking the view there for a second while the camera. Uh, it's staring right down on the liquid fuel uh, booster. I know it's kind of dark, but that's because I'm upside down and the sun is right on top of me. So let's see there. Apoapsis is now at 48 kilometers, I am just about to hit 50, oh, about 40 kilometers for altitude. Pitch is now down to about 10%. 60 kilometers apoapsis, 70 kilometers apoapsis, 80 kilometers, and then main engine shut off. And of course now 
the thing to do is to coast up and while we're coasting we can take a, a view a little bit a pretty view there of Kerbin below us um, you can see how the joystick kind of moves around as I'm I'm uh, putting in input controls and one of the things I didn't notice is there they go the feet are actually controlling the yaw when I when I use the A or the D button to adjust the yaw of the craft the, the feet actually control pedals I never noticed that until I was watching this video anyway we're, what, what's our altitude at here oh just 62 63 kilometers um, I think that was an error actually in saying that these monitors come from the raster prop monitor display I think these are actually built in with B9 aerospace so I've had both of them installed for so long I'm probably getting them mixed up air altitudes over 70 kilometers so I can now uh, I'm, I'm, I'm spamming that brake button because that's what engage or uh, lifts up the air brakes that are on the liquid fuel tank and then I stage to uh, arm the parachutes on the liquid fuel tank so that uh, it will hopefully be recovered which by the way I've already done it and it didn't I don't know what happened but the parachutes never did deploy and it just crashed right into the ground I don't know what why that happened so waiting looking now at time to apoapsis is at 30 just almost at 30 seconds there put on the RCS because I know once I fire up this engine this thing's gonna want to pitch up so I need RCS to help me with control and now I've put my throttle up to 20 percent having that throttle display it's just to the left and at the bottom of the nav ball that that really does help with uh, when you're doing these fine burns because it's really hard to kind of know exactly where your throttle is and I'm watching my periapsis now and once it gets close to 50 kilometers I'm going to shut off and detach that liquid fuel tank so 30 kilometers 40 there we go. Ah, that's close enough. So we stage. There it goes. These little RCS to push ourselves away. Uh, I wish I turned myself around the other way. If I turned myself right side up, um, this thing would have been nicely in the sun rather than now. The, the, the camera is actually staring right in the sun. That yellow dot is the sun. So that's why it's so dark. So that's unfortunate. And then we finish off our circularization getting our periapsis up to a little over 80 kilometers. There we go, that's pretty good. And then unfortunately now I do have to leave the cockpit view because um, I can't extend the solar panels because I don't have, uh, it'd be really nice to be able to um, use uh, action groups to be able to do things and then I could have stayed right in here, but no, there's no way out of it. I gotta, I gotta get out here and extend the solar panels uh, manually this way. And now it's time to plan our rendezvous, but rather than using a maneuver node and doing it kind of the old way, with the success of using Kerbal Engineer um, and using that uh, intercept angle to plan our rendezvous, I'm gonna use I'm gonna use that for doing the rendezvous here. So I'm not gonna make a maneuver node, and I'm gonna use the rendezvous indicator here on um, on the interior view. So we we get rid of the uh, the external camera we don't need this and we're going to select Hipparchus station as our target and it's going to give us a lot of information about Hipparchus station but one of the things it doesn't give us is the uh, intercept angle so I am going to have to open up Kerbal Engineer just for that one little window but before we do that I thought well you know this thing is giving me uh, relative inclinations and the times to the relative ascending and descending nodes so I thought you know what why don't I match inclinations and I know in the past I've said a couple of times uh, don't match inclinations on maneuvers but because I'm going to be doing this completely blind in the sense that I'm not doing it from the map view I won't have uh, a nice maneuver node to help me out so no I think I think I need all the help I'm going to get so I am going to match my inclinations. So I see that I got the relative descending node coming up, so I turn myself positive normal and wait for it to come up and just start to burn, watching my uh, inclination coming down till I get it down as close to zero as I feel I can comfortably get. So we get up our Kerbal Engineer rendezvous window and it's then I realized I did something pretty foolish. I was so fixated on doing this launch from the internal view that I completely forgot to time my launch. The park station is just nowhere near where I am. So uh, I have to do a lot of 
time warping now to catch up to where Hipparchus Station is. And one of the things I did notice on the uh, orbital maneuver or the orbital uh, information window on the left is that uh, once you've selected Hipparchus or your target, it shows that target orbit as well and the location of your target. So I can watch it going around in there, and here you can get a pretty good idea of just how far behind I was. And Manuki, she didn't seem to mind the delay, gave her an opportunity to watch, well, several sunrises. But then we got to the point that we were ready to do our burn and again, what we're doing is we're waiting for that intercept angle to get down to zero, and then that tells me when I need to perform my burn. And uh, as far as how much to make my burn, I know that Hipparchus Station is at an altitude of about 120 kilometers. So I thought, well, I'll just burn into my apoapsis is up to 120 kilometers and hope for the best. And then once the burn was complete, I took a look over at the rendezvous uh, target window, and I saw a closest approach of about 190 meters, and I thought, well, that ain't bad. I'll, I'll take that to the bank any day. And then, of course, we uh, time warp over towards our rendezvous, and, and everything I need, including, you know, distance to targeting, distant closest approach, and uh, the target icon on the nav ball, everything I need was right here. So I, I did the, the whole approach uh, just from again inside the cockpit and once I got it down to uh, under a hundred meters to the target I thought it would be time to actually take a look at what I'm going for all the time through this I never did get to see a park station I was doing this all just by the instruments and blind so I I spun the vessel around and uh, yeah I got myself a look at a park station kind of hanging there all alone in the night but I know we all know how, how serene it looks from the outside, you know, it's it's pretty crowded in on the inside, but I think, you know, they've been they've been uh, living it up and lots of snacks and having a good time, but it was time for this party to end. So Manuki used RCS to kind of close the gap a little bit, and then it was time to call the guys on home. So I wasn't going to dock, though, because, um, and, and it wasn't for fear of messing up the docking port. I, I went and I, I reattached that docking port in a different way, used some cubic oct octagonal thrust or that cubic octagonal struts i don't know why i had trouble getting that out to uh to hopefully attach that docking port and it was actually a little bit better and i was hoping i was eager to actually test it but i didn't want to dock because i was worried i would end up mucking up the timer that is timing down the 50 days for the uh contract to do a crew rotation. I noticed a couple of videos before this that uh, that timer kept kind of restarting every time I seemed to dock a vessel and undock a vessel and all that stuff. So I thought, you know what, the best thing to do, just bring it up close, don't dock, we'll EVA over to the ship, and then it was time to uh, plan our descent. So with everyone safely aboard, Manuki begins to turn the craft away from the Hipparchus station and uses a little bit of RCS to give us some uh, velocity and increase our distance from the station and then it's time to time warp our way to the opposite side of Kerbin from the Kerbal Space Center and just like always what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the trajectories mod except this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my uh, prediction for where I'm going to land right on top of the Kerbal Space Center instead of in the water and uh, then it's time to time warp our way over. But while I was on my way over, I mean, I got a lot of fuel still left in this thing, and I want to try and reduce the weight. So I use um, uh, TAC Fuel Balancer, a great mod for dumping some of this fuel. So I'm going to dump some of the liquid fuel and some of the oxidizer. Now, as far as my descent profile goes, what I like to do is enter into the atmosphere in full belly flop mode with my pitch up 90 degrees and the whole point of this is just to try and do what I can to bleed off as much speed as I can and I can't but I won't be able to hold this attitude forever because as the air gets thicker uh, this isn't going to work and then it'll get to the point I use RCS to try and hold the attitude as long as I can but it gets to the point where uh, it's I'm not going to be able to hold it anymore and I'm going to have to pitch forward and from this point I'm using the air brakes to try and again slow down my descent. The whole idea here with space planes is to try and go in in a controlled way. You do not want your descent to be down going down too quickly. So I'm looking at my vertical velocity. Now to be fair, 
I'm probably being a little overcautious here because uh, I, on my one simulation I did with this uh, with this orbiter uh, on my descent I ended up burning off uh, the uh, lower air brakes, the air brakes that are on the underside of the wings. So I'm really being cautious here and watching my uh, vertical speed and trying to keep it reasonably low, but of course still going down and still bleeding off speed. And uh, yeah, I get to the point where I thought, you know what, I'm going to even take out more liquid fuel. So I took off even more liquid fuel with the uh, pack fuel balancer. But I can see here that I was being overly cautious. Although this went down very, very safely, I can see now that I'm going to be overshooting the runway. But that's that's no big deal. Um, so we just uh, going to be able to do a bit of a turn here. And then it's time to uh, make our final approach towards the runway. Now, by this point, I was actually starting to have some trouble keeping the nose up as the speed went down. I, I, I'm a little bit too nose heavy. Uh, there's two things I could have done a little bit differently to help me in this situation. Number one was to um, not drain off so much of the liquid fuel. Or number two, I have all of my monopropellant still in the nose cone. I can easily have moved some of that back to the empty tank that I have underneath where the uh, docking bay doors are. But either way, come in, I have to put RCS on at the last minute, and the landing's a little bit hard, but uh, no, it, it, it actually came out all pretty fine. Uh, one thing I want to point out here is, you know, I've been talking with planes to always have them sort of pitched up when they're sitting on the runway, or at least have a neutral pitch. Notice that this one's actually pitched down, and if you have a plane that you'll never take off from the runway, pitching it down is a great way to allow the aerodynamics to help you stick the landing. And with that, this episode comes to its end. I hope to see you next time.